The field of quantum information sciences is much broader and more diverse than just quantum computing. Today we dove into the world of quantum with Jen Savada, President of Public Sector at Sandbox AQ, who shared her insights on quantum use cases and applications, as well as other emerging technologies shaping the government landscape. If you enjoy this interview, please like, share, subscribe, and turn on notifications. And if you're interested in being interviewed, email summer at executivemosaic.com. Hello, and welcome to Executive Mosaic's video interview series. I'm Summer Myatt, and here to speak with me today is Jen Savada, President of Public Sector at Sandbox AQ. Jen, thank you so much for joining us. Summer, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm really looking forward to our conversation today. So Jen, to start, quantum has really taken over the federal government as a huge priority in recent years. Can you explain what exactly the field of quantum information sciences is? Yeah, absolutely. So quantum information sciences really isn't as difficult as many people think it is. It's really at the, the level of atoms and talking about what is going on with atoms that move back and forth in an excited state in order to create faster processing, more sensitive information, or enabling us to do things that we haven't done before. Current technology really deals with bits, and now we're dealing with atoms. So where are you seeing opportunities for quantum technology to be used in the public sector? And could you maybe give us some use cases? Yes, sure. So quantum information sciences is one of those things that a lot of people associate with just quantum computers. But in reality, there's a whole host of things that can be done with quantum information sciences. And it's really broken down into three main categories. The first category is quantum computers, as well as quantum simulation. So simulating quantum computers with classical hardware and quantum inspired algorithms or other capabilities that enable us to get to quantum speeds. The second area is quantum sensing. And with quantum sensing, it is things like being able to detect the magnetic field of the earth or the magnetic field of our heart. And within applications for the US government, there's things like quantum navigation or precision navigation and timing, which we can use atomic clocks, which are quantum inspired devices and quantum devices, as well as quantum sensors that enable us to navigate without GPS in GPS denied integrated environments. And then the last area that we really focus on within quantum is quantum communications and quantum secure communications in particular. And there's two different types of quantum secure communications. One is sort of the quantum internet, the next level of the internet or quantum key distribution, which is being able to, to send information um, in a quantum state from one end, from one node to another. And then the other one is preparing for, to prevent um, attacks from quantum computers. And that's called post-quantum cryptography. It's enabling a different type of cryptography that allows us to protect from things like store now, decrypt later attacks from our adversaries. So Jen, experts have been saying that full-scale quantum capabilities could be decades away. When do you think we will start to see quantum in action? Yeah, that's a really hard question to answer. And the reason why is because quantum technology for quantum computers in particular continues to accelerate with never, every new um, discovery and every new advancement, it seems to accelerate the next advancement even more. But what's more important than when is it going to be here is how do we protect ourselves against it in addition to being prepared to use the capabilities that it will provide. And the first thing we need to do is to be able to protect our cryptography and protect our data from those quantum attacks that will happen in the future. And as I mentioned just previously, the store now decrypt later attacks are a way that our adversaries are getting access to our data today. They're taking our data, they're siphoning off all of our um, networks and our, our infrastructure, and they're storing it in their own data centers with the goal that when they have a fault tolerant, um, coherent quantum computer, that they will be able to decrypt that data instantaneously. And from a national security perspective, if we look at it from the perspective of, we have um, pharma companies, we have a Merck, a Johnson & Johnson, a Pfizer, and they all have independent trials and they're, they've been trying to find a cure for cancer or they're trying to prevent 
um, some sort of biologic from getting out into the world. What happens if, if an adversary pulls all of that information together from all these disparate companies and now has the cure for cancer or they understand how to launch a biologic weapon and they control that data? That can be a national security um, threat for us that we need to be prepared for. So, Jen, what is being done today to protect against those threats in the future and where do we need more focus? Yeah, there's a couple of different things. There's the technology side of it first. And then the second thing is our partnerships and coalitions. And then the third thing is talent. And so let me talk about each of those individually. The first one from a technology perspective is to develop the quantum technologies and then the quantum resistant technologies that enable us to do that. Um, like we're doing at Sandbox, we have a post-quantum cryptography capability where you can inventory your system, you can manage that inventory and the data that comes off of it, and then start to remediate or plan for how do you prepare and protect your cybersecurity um, enterprise and ecosystem uh, from those quantum attacks. The second thing is the coalitions that I mentioned. And the US government in particular is really starting to look at how do we enhance and, and try to prevent the quantum divide from becoming even greater than it is. Currently, there are 18 countries that have quantum security and quantum strategies. And we need to continue to advance quantum technology globally so that we can build an entire ecosystem where this technology is readily available and readily used. And we need to look at organizations like AUKUS or the Quad, which is um, Japan, India, uh, Australia, and the US, in order to build coalitions where we come together, not just for creating new submarines, but also for quantum technologies and um, future AI capabilities. And then the last one is talent. Talent is something that's international, especially in the quantum space. And we need to understand that quantum talent is built all around us. And in order to do that, we need to be able to upskill our workforce, support those that are in programs um, through residencies, internships, and scholarships, and then enabling that talent to move globally in order to enhance the United States and its quantum programs, as well as those of our allies. So which other emerging technologies do you think could play a part in shaping the federal government going forward and even accelerating quantum development? Yeah, interesting. There's so many technologies that we hear about that are in the emerging technology space. But one that is really interesting to me, which has um, a, a really a, a foothold and is important to quantum technology is sort of the biologic sphere. One of the areas that we are looking at is with simulation and optimization, which would then migrate to quantum computers, is how do we accelerate things like drug discovery, material science, um, battery enhancement, and battery efficiency. That is all based on biology, because biology is at the core foundation of how we develop new materials, how we look at how our bodies interact with new drugs and with other biologics that we're trying to do in order to create new drugs. Um, and prevent um, pandemics, epidemics that are out there today, and then also to make things more efficient. And so once we are able to marry sort of this biologic capability with quantum and AI, we have the ability to accelerate the development of all of those capabilities. You mentioned AI, which has really been making waves in the public and private sectors in recent years. I'm wondering how you see AI changing the tech landscape in the US and what are your thoughts on its adoption in the public sector space? So AI is something that's been around for a very long time. And just like quantum, it's continuing to accelerate faster and faster. I think that we will, will see areas where AI will um, enhance uh, our capabilities, but it also has the ability to, if we don't use the data the right way or to understand where, where the data comes from, it could be detrimental. Uh, for example, a lot of people are using these LLMs, these large language models, and the problem is, is they don't know where the data is stored. So if you have someone from the U.S. government who is just doing research on a project that might be of interest to the U.S. government, that data may be stored someplace else and other people have access to it. Because one of the things that makes LLM so powerful is the continual feeding of knowledge and data into an LLM, which allows it to then use those algorithms to create even more 
um, insights. And so we have to be cautious as to where we share our data, how we share our data, and then understand how it is collated and, um, and created into that new amount of information. Well, Jen, thank you so much for sharing your insights with us today and for all the work you do at Sandbox. Thank you for a wonderful conversation. <music>